Welcome to this video on individual and political consequences in this video series on our successful future. In this video I would like to collect, so to speak, the results from the previous video and condense them to some conclusions. What are the questions that I want to answer? Well, here they are. What are the consequences for us individually if the sustainable development goals shall be reached? And what does this mean for policies and politics? Now, just let's first recall, so to speak, from the introductory uh, video, what the situation actually is. We have seen that as compared to the pre-industrial level, the temperature, the global mean temperature has been increasing, especially during the last decade. So the color code is the temperature and this is uh, the horizontal axis is the time. So here we see it's getting much hotter. We are right now at the we have reached one degree climate change as compared to, to pre-industrial level and have shown also this diagram which shows the CO2, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere versus time and we see that nothing changed significantly in the trend of the last year and if we continue with the trend it will very soon in very few decades get significantly worse and we should try to put all effort into avoiding that because these situations that are to be expected at these climate changes, at these temperature increases, they are quite dramatic the world will be a much worse place than it is now. So we really should put all effort into changing that development. Now I discussed different aspects and I will only briefly remind us of the major out uh, outcomes. I don't go into the details. If you want to understand the details, please go to the corresponding videos. I've shown that according to the scenarios that you look at for the world population as a function of time, it is to be expected that the most probable development be, be, will be at the high to the medium variant, possibly more the high variant. It's not improbable that it, that it will develop that way. And we should be avoiding that by all means because that means continual exponential increase of resource consumption and waste production. And that is of course a bad situation that always pushes, and I have shown that with several uh, occasions in the, on several occasions on this, these videos, so it will always push the demand that we have for technological improvement really to the final limits that we can possibly hope to reach. I've also shown that this population growth um, leads to uh, significant world hunger directly, also taken from the introductory uh, video. We feed today 2.5 billion people more than 1990, but at the same time population increased by 2.3 billion people. So we reduced the number of undernourished people only by 200 million people. And there we see directly that our progress in agricultural productivity is directly eaten up, literally eaten up by population growth. At the same time, we have to keep in mind more than 800 million people are undernourished at the moment here and now in this world, not in some future. And that's of course a very, very bad situation. More than 10% of the people are, are unannourished. Then I discussed the energy transitions, the sustainable energy transition. I've shown that it works. We can reach the climate goals with scenarios that I have shown and explained. But we also realize that especially in this phase of transition, um, the vulnerability of the companies, economies and nations is quite critical because here major fractions of our industries will change, will shift from their feedstock, their feedstock shift from fossil resources to renewable resources and that's a complete rebuilding of our economies and that's of course leading to a significant vulnerability of the economies. On the other hand side, these economies have to pay, so to speak, for these changes. So it's us who pay for that and we use our economies to create the corresponding benefit, profit, the available capital in order to realize all these things. So that's quite important to keep that in mind. We should work carefully with our economies at the same time as we do all these changes. I've also shown that things will get worse the longer we wait. If we don't increase the efforts more or less today, the effort that would then be required to reach the climate goals, depending on the population variant, will increase dramatically if we want to reach the 1.5 degree climate goal. And there we see that we are already in this, in, in this phase where things are getting worse and worse quite quickly. So the effort that we need to take in order to reach the climate goal is already strongly decreasing every, increasing every year. 
On the other hand side, if you only want only want to reach the plus two degrees centigrade climate goal, we see we are still in the in the range where this is slowly increasing. We can wait another 20 years until we more or less reach the same state that we have today with the 1.5 degree climate goal, where we know it's bad. So actually, this also tells us in inverse, so to speak, we should start now because now the effort that we need to take is still very limited. We can manage if we start now. And actually, this is already bad. We actually want to aim at this climate goal, so we should move left as far as possible. So we should not go for these goals, but even for higher goals that we somewhere wind up possibly at 1.6, 1.5, 1.7 uh, degrees, which is significantly better than the plus 2 degrees centigrade. Then I also have shown this diagram where um, the land area that is used is shown as a function of time. In, uh, well, in the past, the arable land, meadows and pastures, and the forests, of course, that extends to the, to the top. And this is that land area that can, in principle, be used for agricultural purposes. Only that land area is shown. And I have shown that there are two main drivers. And the main drivers is, on the one hand side, the population growth. If we do not manage to somehow um, reduce population growth, we will always push the technological development to its limit. Agriculture has to intensify at the utmost rate possible, more or less, into the far future. If you want to avoid that, we need to reduce population growth. And the second thing which is mentioned here, we need to change our nutritional habits, less animal-based food, more plant-based food. And I should mention that here, these are the major drivers. There's no other driver as big as these two. Population growth means we can reduce our consumption by a factor of two easily. If we shift the, uh, if we change our nutritional habits, it's another, another factor of two getting it's simpler to achieve sustainability. Both have more or less a factor of two in, uh, in, uh, that they can, meet, can, can reach. And these are the biggest factors. Any technological improvement can by far not reach such big factors. So these are really the big drivers behind all the entire system. Why is the animal-based food so important? That I showed as well. If you look at the food calories that you eat in the end on global average, this is the plant-based uh, plant uh, calories and these are the animal-based calories. Around 17% of the calories that we have as an uptake globally is animal-based. Only that small fraction. On the other hand side, this is the land area that we use to produce that. And also this arable land is used partly for food, uh, animal based food production because on that we produce the feed, the feed for the animals. And if you now compare what we are producing on this arable land, we produce on the one hand side things that we eat directly as plant based food afterwards. And this is the fraction for the feed. So of that fraction already a large part, a larger part is also going for the animal-based food. So that shows that animal-based food production is quite inefficient. And we can reduce world hunger instantaneously if everybody would shift to more plant-based food. Again, reminding us that 800 milli million people are undernourished. That means that's the goal actually for today, not for the far future. Now we can collect the information to a certain degree. We have seen that there are two challenges, two major challenges, climate change, which we can solve, so to speak, by a sustainable energy transition. And we have seen the competition for land area between food production, bioenergy and biomaterials production. While the first challenge can be solved just by technology, we have the available technology at hand. We only need to supply it and apply it on a larger scale. The second thing, the second competition, or second challenge can only be solved by changes or can easiest be ch uh, solved by changing our behavior. No technological change will allow as much, pro or as much easing up the system as our behavioral changes. The significant drivers I mentioned that, and they are really the biggest drivers behind, is the population growth and it's the choice between vegetal and animal-based food stuff. Now, population growth we typically take as given, but actually we have to realize it's not given. It's our choice how many children we want to have. So it's us who decides. Same with the animal-based food and, and plant-based food, it's us who decide. So we are the drivers behind that. Complete shift is required in major branches of our industries, major sectors. And that means, as I mentioned already, this vulnerability, because we have to overcome these corresponding changes here 
at the same time making sure that all the system is running smoothly and even if the economy is not going so well due to these changes, possibly um, unemployment in some of the branches, people use for, need it for other branches and that of course leads to significant demands of this entire system. So that is a, quite a challenge to manage that. So we have to keep in mind that we have to keep our economy running, well running, in order to pay us all these changes that are required and the progress that is required. Again, this uh, fossil resource replacement that is required, if you want to reach the 1.5 degree climate goal, we need to reach 3% per year substitution rate, substituting fossil energy technologies with su sustainable energy technologies. If you want to reach the plus 2 degree centigrade great goal, we need to have a, su a substitution rate of 2% per year until the year 2075. This defines the time scales through which we have to maintain those high levels. Today we have a growth rate of solar and wind energy respect with respect to the a primary energy consumption of 0.5%. So our current substitution rate is somewhere like this and we need see that we have to increase that to these values, factor 4, factor 6, if we want to reach the climate goals. What are the steps that we need to take? Well, of course we need, should use all technological options that we have at hand. Of course we need to do that. But we also need to question the paradigms. And if you want to get a little bit more insight how important paradigms are, I can advise you to read the book of J. Diamond. It's called Collapse. The subtitle is something like uh, how societies choose to survive or to uh, die out, something like that. And uh, he shows actually from observing historical development in certain regions that if people were not able to shift their paradigms, their traditions, their beliefs, then they died out. That's a, quite a major driver. So we have to really rethink that. So how about plant-based nutrition, how, the right of how many children do we actually have? And there we have to realize actually that these things are really important. We have to question them. If we don't, we will not be able to survive anymore. So we, if you just continue like that, well, it's so convenient to uh, have, or it's so nice to have animal-based food and it's I love to have many children. Yes, that's nice. But if that hinders the survival of humanity, apparently we need to question that. There's no way around that. Yeah? These traditions got us here. If we don't change them, we won't be able to survive. But we directly clearly have to see that. Also, we need to ask to question how to be, speak religion as a basis for defining the values of a sustainability ethics. Because religion is, so to speak, behind these things to a certain degree. I will show that on the next slide. We also need to talk about justice, the international justice. If the major players in this international well, system, economic system, they will change. It won't be any more those countries who are today selling and making their income from fossil resources. And in the future, it will be more plant-based things. So who has lots of agricultural land that shifts, apparently? That leads to, of course, demands on international level. Intergeneration, us, our children and their offspring. Who is responsible for what? Apparently, it's us, more or less. And transitorial. So across this change, there are certain demands that need to be taken into account. Developing other countries, for example, is one of these things. And questions that one can directly ask and that have to be answered is how is the burden for environmental protection distributed? Who should do what in order to reach that? And we have to keep in mind these are the major drivers. Yeah? Who has to do what also with respect to that? How is the burden for development distributed? Because we see, saw in one of the diagrams that I showed that um, less wealth, uh, so less um, GDP, gross domestic product, per capita leads to a higher fertility, more children. And of course, we need to reduce that because we realize population growth is one of the major drivers. So how can we develop countries so to reduce their population growth? And how is that linked to the, with the reduction of fertility? Yeah, so possibly it's a give and take. Yeah? We supply the means and they take more care of reducing the fertility, the children that are uh, that they have, more or less. So how is that, so to speak, interrelated to a certain degree in a just way, according to ethics that apply for everybody? How will trade with nutrition and energy be organized in the future? I mentioned that already the main nations that supply uh, 
the different things in the future will be different from those who supply that today. A word on religion. If we look, for example, at the sustainability uh, encyclica of Pope Francis, Laudato Si, published in 2015, he says, demographic growth is fully compatible with an integral and shared development. I think I've shown that that is not so. Reducing population growth is the most significant driver behind everything because it's us who are producing the waste and it's us who are consuming the resources. Minimizing the number of us, me and you, of course, that leads to a better survival for humanity. So this is simply wrong. Having religion as the highest level of standard, so to speak, with respect to ethics, may not be the optimum. There has to be something on top of that which takes the sustainability into account because it's not to be expected that religions will change as quickly as is required. And we see it's only a few decades. If you see how many thousand years Catholic Church is now more or less constant, we have to keep in mind now we have to do the change in a few decades. If that is not done, we are lost. Similar things uh, refer to the Quran. I know that's sort of dangerous to announce, to, to say that, but it says simply wealth and sons are the adornment of the life of this world. So be proud of as many sons as you can have, more or less. That's implied behind that. Does that make sense? The same thing as here. Yeah. No, apparently not. There has to be some guideline above religions, generally speaking, that helps us to become sustainable. Sticking with religion is not a solution, simply because that got us here and we have to change, apparently, if we want to survive. At the same time, we have rules in place that are actually a little bit on top of that, or significantly on top of that. Possibly, they are not really realized sufficiently in sufficient detail. Namely, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, more or less all countries uh, accepted those. And there are, on the one hand side, competing or conflicting uh, rights that we have. We have the right to found a family, implying, of course, children. Uh, then, of course, we have the right for, for thought, conscience and religion. And we can do that not just with our beliefs, but also with respect to our practice. So if our religion tells us that we should be proud of many children, we can practice that, we can realize that. On the other hand side, the human rights says that we have the right for standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of ourselves and our families, including food. And there we see already that we have a conflicting goals here, conflicting rights, food and as many children as we like, that doesn't fit together. We have to somehow find ways to well, limit one in order to have sufficient of the other. And actually there are goals already, already mentioned or ways mentioned in these human rights. A little bit further down in the paragraphs, possibly most of us don't read until then, but it says that we have the right for an international order in which the rights can be fully realized. I don't know any international right that limits my food, the food habits and I don't know any international right that somehow deals with population growth, even though they are the major drivers. So we actually have the right for these things, but they don't exist. Nobody took care until now to realize that. We have the right for an international order that supplies all the rights to us or that allow, ensures all the rights to us, but we don't have it. On the other hand side, it says everybody has duties. So like in, in, in traffic and street traffic, yeah, in, in Germany, the car coming from the right has the right of way. Of course, that means a duty for the person coming from the left to stop. Yeah, it's the same in here with the rights. There are also duties involved in that. And they, of course, there cannot be any duties. So we cannot take that as an argument to induce any duties, but it should be only those duties, those limitations that are then imposed on us that are determined by law solely for the purpose of securing due recognition and respect of the rights and freedoms of others, of course, those mentioned in these human rights. So if there are conflicting uh, rights, then we can impose duties on everybody, but only such that we ensure the, these, uh, that these rights can be really fully developed. So we cannot exceed that. But if we realize that limiting population growth, so limiting the number of children and changing our nutritional habits, are the main drivers behind, behind the entire system, then of course we need to derive duties from that and they have to be found finally on, and put in place by an international order, agreeing globally, so to speak. That's what's actually required. It's mentioned here already. It's there already. We didn't realize it until now. Then we have to see something else, namely that um, 
all of us are individuals and we have to keep that in mind because, um, well, why actually? Well, we are individual citizens, me and you apparently. We are individuals. We, on the one hand side, have certain demands that are then supplied by the corresponding companies by industry. The companies, on the other hand side, are managed by the company managers. At the same time, we elect our politicians and they, we assume that they organize our life in an efficient way. Politicians, we also assume that they control the company managers for reaching this final goal, stable, sustainable development. Of course, the company managers, they are individuals as well. They want to maximize their income and the income of their shareholders. So they negotiate with the politicians to get the maximum for themselves. The politicians, on the other hand side, if they are elected, they, we have to realize they are individuals as well. They have to feed their family. They have to pay the loan for their house. So they rely on being re-elected. So for them, for none of these three individual players, the goal is to have a sustainable, a stable development. Yeah. Only the entire system somehow has to organize that. And if, you, if everybody looks at his own benefit, is it, uh, um, uh, simplicity of life, uh, um, th then of course the, it's not necessarily said that this entire system will develop in the right direction. Complications are further induced by NGOs and, and religions. Uh, so non-governmental organizations and religions, because the question for that is always what is their legitimation? Whom are they representing? Well, of course, some NGOs have members, many members, and they are representing them, so that's fine. But there are some NGOs around, and I have seen, for example, people appearing in, in conferences, big conferences on uh, bioeconomy in a very prominent uh, position in the program. And then if you look at the website, you realize it's a single person doesn't state anything about the goals, doesn't state anything how he or she is paid, uh, so where are the funds coming from to running that, and that is of course not acceptable in principle because you don't know these things. And there one has to be careful about these things, of course, also with religions, I mentioned that previously. So do they represent really legitimate goals, and how are they controlled? Here in that system we have control embodied, so to speak. Citizens are electing politicians, that's imposing some control of that in democracies at least. So the politicians are quite well controlled and we assume that they are controlling the companies. So that's complicating matters a little bit. But we have to realize that these three main individual groups are those that are driving that. And actually the main driver is us because we are having our demands that are then supplied. We are electing the politicians. So it's us who is important in this triangle to reach that. Until now, we, so to speak, just do the things according to how it is convenient for us, but we have to realize that it, that it does not necessarily lead to this stable, sustainable development. In order to reach that, this goal, we need to take a systems view mentioned down here. So it's essential that we, who are the only drivers behind that, that we are taking the systems view of the entire system in order to be able to realize what we should do in order to reach that in our actions that we take with respect to electing politicians, having certain demands, for example. Also, how much we are influenced by these things. Also, we need to take that into account. Now, the systems view, I want to specify that or express it more explicitly, that does the free interplay of forces automatically lead to a sustainable system? I think I argued that it's not necessarily so. So we need to take the systems view. We have to realize that the, we as individuals, me as well as you personally watching this video, that we are the main drivers. And one reason why we are so important is because we are the only entity with this, within the, the, the system, so to speak, the individuals that have the freedom of choice. A nation doesn't, have, doesn't freely choose. Uh, they can elect, it's a complicated process. We can instantaneously choose to act differently, to behave differently. Instantaneous free action, free choice. It's us who has, who has that. Neither companies, yeah, they also can't change directly and also they are not completely free apparently. It's us who have this really free choice uh, that then defines, how to speak, how the system will behave. And that means in the end, this system's view that the individual has to be aware of his or her influence on the system. And that's actually why I recorded the videos. I hope that I have shown some of the major interplays. Even if you don't agree with what I've said, I've shown direct interrelations and you can use them for your own choices as well as in discussions 
the things that you hear from the media, you can directly re relate those things if you have seen the videos. And that's, I think, what is important because it's us in the end who are deciding what's going to happen. Now to work out the us a little bit more. The individual choices determine our future. On the one hand side, limiting the number of children. I mentioned that often enough. Meanwhile, and prefer plant-based versus animal-based nutrition. These are the big main drivers. Of course, we have to reduce the consumption, for example, of fossil resources as well, as far as possible. But we have to keep in mind that that is only limited um, possibility. I will work that out in the next slides. So we need to do that, but these drivers are much bigger than that. And of course, we need to do that also as far as possible, because it's also a tiny little bit contribution, but these contributions are much bigger. Also, the interaction of individuals is important. We have to support politics for sustainability, even if individual benefits are limited. Um, and that is quite important. And one can relate that now a little bit to history, because we have to realize that we somehow have to change our ethics, our ethical guidelines, our values, so to speak. Well, why is that so? We have to realize that ethic has changed over the time. Some hundred years it was customary that we had our slaves. It was so convenient, it was so nice. Yeah, we didn't need to do these garbage things that we didn't want to do. Yeah, they, they were doing it for us. Then we realized later on that that may not be the best thing. Every human being has the equal rights. We, did, we realized that. And I think we, here we have to see the same thing as well for the future. If we want to keep the system going, ethics has to change because otherwise we won't be able to survive. And it doesn't mean that we, well, the, all this convenience that we have at the moment, we have to give that up to a certain degree in order to be able to survive. If we don't do it, we won't survive, at least not in that well-being uh, in which we are living today. If I say well-being in us, of course, it relates to more or less the developed countries, many other people as well in some countries, but the majority of people is not really living in a, in a well-being. Globally, we have to realize that they are just making their living somehow. 800 millions, I mentioned that often enough in this video series, they are starving. That's not well being, that's happening now. So, those things are really important to, to realize that, that this is important that we have to reduce um, the, um, our freedom of choices a little bit, reduce that to those choices that are really helping our sustainability and well being for others to a certain degree. That means also that we have to further develop societal values for sustainability, especially in the human rights and these individual obligations that we may, ha may have. Then we can also generalize or look a little bit at more general things. The solution cannot only be political. It can't be top-down. Politicians can't tell you you eat less animal-based food. It has been tried in Germany once. Big failure. Uh, on the other hand side, uh, it was not really uh, a law or something like that, but they wanted to induce in, in, in uh, public uh, mensas, they wanted to induce, or canteens, they wanted to induce one day of vegan food per week. It was a big failure. Anyway, uh, then of course we need to support development in other countries. So the more developed countries have to help the less developed countries on equal footing, which means of course it's a give and take. We are possibly giving some support for whatever, by whichever means. It can be something quite simple, yeah, uh, relaxing patent laws, for example, or patent restrictions. On the other hand side, it's also a gift from the other side, of course, trying to reduce population growth. So it's a give and take from both directions. It's not big industry managers, as it's often today, going there and seeing the market for their products in that less developed country. That's not the issue, not at all. So we have to really do that on an equal footing, supporting, de really supporting development in those nations. So support sustainable energy transition and energy savings. That's also something which is important. I will work that out in the next slides. Food versus fuel is critical, depending on the, the scenarios that we choose. If we manage to limit the number of children and go for more plant-based foods, it can be realized without problem, but if we don't change, there will be a critical scenario. We will always shift the demand on the technological development to its limits. And all it happens in our lifetime and that of our children is also quite important. A few decades left and then we are lost. 
Now a little bit on these material things, I should mention again what we are using the fossil resources for. So this, are, this depicts the ratio between the main resources that we are using, the fossil resources, and only 4% of that are used for petrochemicals. That is, if you want to discuss saving fossil resources, it doesn't make sense to talk too, too much about petrochemical use. So plastic bags, which are a big issue currently in, in several European countries, plastic straws or plastic cups for our um, uh, takeaway um, uh, coffee, this is not the big issue. This are a few grams. We have to say overall we are using 5.6 kilograms of fossil resources daily and these 4% they are just 220 grams. So if we save that, the big things occur somewhere else. Nevertheless, we should do that, of course. I'm not, please don't get me wrong. I, I say we should do everything that is possible. I mentioned that in the previous slides. But we don't need to expect that that is the major contribution. Any material saving is just, can at most uh, occur on this 4% level. Where does it occur? What do we need to take care of? Well, it's energy, of course. And this is the energy for in developed countries. It's a diagram taken from, from one of the presentations where you see today we are using the energy for these things. Transport, some industrial things, illumination in electronic data processing, steam, industrial furnace and stationary motors. That's more or less industrial stuff. We can't change that so much. There we have to shift to more renewable usage. So more photovoltaics and wind energy. The things that we can induce is transport in the last section here, room heating and air conditioning. We see this is roughly one third, one third, one third, and that are the big parameters that we can choose. Transport, for example, next time you buy a car, buy a smaller car. This will take consumption of, of fuel as a major decisive parameter into account. Also, drive a little bit more slowly. The last 10 kilometers per hour, use excessive uh, fuel. Yeah, so if you reduce that a little bit, you will significantly save energy. Also, one has to keep in mind, again relating to the previous slide, I said 5.6 kilograms of fossil resources we are using daily per year. This is of the order of 2,000 kilograms. If we fly from Europe to San Francisco or to Bangkok for a nice vacation, that is already 500 kilograms. So of this global average of 2,000 kilograms, 500 kilograms, one quarter of that is one round trip to Bangkok to San Francisco. If we save that, instead go for some European goal for our vacation, that's of course cause saving lots of energy. So there we, it's us who take that into account. Room heating and air conditioning in recent years, well, temperature increase, of course, air conditioning is more coming, coming more important. It's becoming more popular as well. That is excessive use of energy, of course. Some degrees more in the room is usually not so detrimental. Also room heating, some less degree, some few degrees less is also often not so detrimental. And we can also look for better house insulation, more efficient uh, methods, not directly doing it electrically, but using, for example, heat pumps for either way. That, is the, that are the points where we can save things and where we have to change things. Of course, we can also go here for electrical cars or at least hybrid cars. And here, as I said, more heat pumps, air heat pumps to uh, heat our rooms. That are those things that are foreseeable as of in the future where we can do something, where we individually can do something. Now, summing up everything, this is now a very compact slide. This is the last slide I want to show. Collect again the major things that I said. Reaching climate goals is possible with available technology, but has to be systematically, systematically applied on large scale. Significant increased global effort is required. Growth rates of sustainable energy of 20 to 30 percent per year are required if we want to reach the climate goals. In the end, we need to replace fossil resources annually by up to 3 percent until 2050 if we want to reach the 1.5 degree climate goal, or by 2 percent per year until 2050. 2075 if we want to reach only the 2 degrees centigrade climate goal. We are going for this one, so we should try to increase that as much as possible, close to the 3%, where I, be, where I personally believe, at least on current status, that we will not be able to reach that really. Food supply is critical, but change of individual choices is essential, meaning the number of children and plant-based versus animal-based food. I mentioned that often enough meanwhile. Bio-based or CO2-based materials production is feasible, but not solely from third-generation biomass. If you watched the 
video on the option set we have, you, you understand that. Third generation biomass is that which is stemming from byproducts of our food production, rice straw, corn straw, and that is not sufficient to produce all the materials that we are using. On the other hand side, we have both options, bio-based, so using plants to collect the sun energy and then convert it into materials. It's one For that we need land area, agricultural land area, but we don't need so much additional energy. If we take the CO2 from processes or from the air, uh, if we recover that, we don't need agricultural land area, but we need lots of energy for that. So these, both of these have drawbacks. On the other hand side, the bio-based route is more or less worked out. It works at least on pilot plant scale, so it has been shown that it's feasible. The CO2 base still has to show that, that it's feasible. And how this competition will wind up in the end, which one will win, so to speak, or if both of them will have their place in the future system, future will have to tell. We can't tell at the moment. Personally, I believe, very personally, that this is a little bit worse off because it still has to show that it works economically. And as a chemical engineer, if I look at the processes, that's quite a challenge to make that feasible. This works, but unfortunately competes with the land area. So, of course, it depends also a little bit on how the future will develop. If population will, growth will be maximum, we don't change to more plant-based food. This is getting more critical and then this is more likely. If we manage population growth and change to more plant-based nutrition, then bio-based is presumably the easier thing to go. Bioenergy has to be minimized because we always run into the competition between fuel, fuel and food production. Some things are required. 2% of 2.5% of our fossil resources go into jet fuel. And today we don't have any other option than using liquid fuels for that. So we need bioenergy in a sustainable develop a sustainable world, so to speak. Could also be CO2 based, of course, but that the, the previous discussions apply to that as well, of course. We have seen that we need to take a systems view instead of focusing on our own interests and benefits and conveniences. I should discuss that we can run into a developmental tipping point because apparently this entire system has to develop and that requires that there is somebody who can pay certain things. And this, that's of course the, less, the, the more developed countries who have to support the less developed countries somehow in this interplay leading to, well, more development in the less developed countries, leading to a lower fertility, quite automatically, reducing population growth. So we require that in the more developed countries, we require the less developed countries to develop. And it can be that, of course, we miss the point that we have to, especially with the climate change situation, climate situation getting worse, food situation getting worse, population getting too much, so that we can't help them anymore, just Feeding the people will not be possible anymore. Actually, in the last years, number of undernourished people has been increasing. That's quite negative, really negative. It indicates that something can be horribly wrong with the system. Um, but, so we can, it can happen that we will not be able to feed the people sufficiently to reduce the population growth, and then the system can explode more or less, or can increase limitless the population, then we are lost more or less, and we can't manage the sustainable energy transition anymore. We don't have enough capital, economic power available to do all these things. So that can ha happen as well. The sooner we start with the changes and the more um, systematically and really wanting the things we are approaching that, the better it will be for us. The easier the transition will become. We are, on the other hand side, individually responsible. It's not just a question of politics and technology. And it has to happen now, otherwise the situation will get bad during our lifetime and that of our children. We saw this time scale is some few decades. This is me, two decades or so. Then uh, I hope to live by then, until then at least. So I will experience that myself, possibly you as well, if you are a little bit younger, definitely so. And our children will experience these bad situations as well. And they don't need just getting worse, it's really getting bad. I should say something, this individual res responsibility is now part of the following videos, which actually deal with more philosophical aspects, where I will work out why we have free will, based on certain considerations that I will show, starting again a little bit from, from, from physics. So if you are interested in that, you are of course invited to watch those videos as well. With that, I think I have 
shown everything. I've shown, I've shown the interrelation between the main drivers. I have worked them out clearly enough, I hope. And I have shown it's possible to manage. We can, but it's us individually who take, who have to take the first step because then everything will work. We can't wait for somebody else doing it. That does not work. It's us individually who has to do that. With that, I have given you hopefully some background for your personal life, for also how to, or also something relating to the news that you get on the media, discussions that you have with friends or other people. Uh, this possibly gives you some background to relate things a little bit and put in a proper perspective. So for this video, I would like to say thank you for watching it and I hope to see you again in one of the other videos.